This method is um, sort of got developed um, very early on in the 30s or 40s. Kantorovich, I think 1939, and Danzig. are the pioneers, um, where, of course, they came up with a very sort of robust method of identifying the vertex or vertices of a simplex um, <clears throat> regardless of the number of variables. So it could be 20 variables. It could be 50 constraints, you know, it could be a very large um, problem, non uh, linear programming problem. And still, um, of course, with some exceptions, um, be able to kind of efficiently find the optimal uh, solution for that linear programming problem. And the idea was to kind of do a search on vertices. Now. Somebody already pointed out is even in that um, simple minded example, two variables in the plane, why not just uh, check the value of the objective function at all the vertices? And that's perfectly uh, fine. In, in the plane, you, have, you can see what all the vertices are, and there are only four. So you could say, well, which vertex has the biggest objective function? Or where is the objective function the greatest? and you find the vertex, right? You don't have to do much. In 3D and, of course, in when the uh, feasible set is a simplex in 20 dim dimensions, it's impossible to figure out all the vertices. In fact, just a computation of all the vertices is, is a task that's kind of um, totally inefficient, and it has, um, you know, no practical value. So instead, you'd like to kind of generate vertices as you go along, but only follow the path that leads you to the optimal vertex. And of course, you've got to have an initial vertex to start with, and that's that's could be a, that's a problem. If I have pick pick the initial vertex, it's not always the origin. Um, of course, if the origin is a vertex in this in your uh, constraints, uh, in your, in your uh, uh, feasible set, then uh, that's, that's a one choice. Um, but identifying an optimal path, or, or the shortest, not the shortest path, but a, a quick path to the optimal uh, vertex. That's what the simplex method is, is about. And there is not a single method to, to do that, to start with an initial um, guess or an initial solution and move towards the optimal solution. There's not a single method. I mean, there are several methods to do that. That's why this is a special, has a special name. And computationally, I'll show you in MATLAB, there are several implementations of this linear programming. Uh, one is a simplex method, and uh, there is also what's called a large scale method, which is based on a, on a dual problem. We'll talk about that on, on Wednesday. What is a dual to the linear programming problem? Anyway, so today I want to uh, focus on the simplex method. <coughs> so um, uh, the idea is to, is to um, uh, generate um, path to the optimal vertex, or to an optimal vertex, um, in an efficient uh, fashion, okay. and this was this is for regardless of the number of 
of um, variables or constraints. Okay. But before we do that, we need to kind of standardize the way this um, LPP uh, linear programming problems appear. So we're going to be standardized in the following. In the following, remember we said some some constraints could be less than, some constraints could be greater than, some constraints could be equal. Um, what we'd like to do is to look at linear programming problems in a standard form format. <coughs> And I would like to minimize. So, not even whether maximize or minimize, just minimize the objective function, which is linear. So it's cx subject to all equality constraints. And you might ask, why, um, why this choice? Well, the choice of minimize versus maximize is pretty arbitrary. So I just stick with the, what the book uses. Okay? And several of the implementations of the uh, linear programming <clears throat> algorithms, especially MATLAB, use the same. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's like choosing left versus right. Okay? Now, if you, had, if you had to maximize a problem like before, right? how can you turn it into a minimization problem? Simply take the negative of the coefficients of the objective function. And instead of maximizing the function, is the same as minimizing the negative opposite function. Okay, so that's why this is not so important. How do we convert, for instance, if we have some inequality constraints, how do we convert them to equality constraints? That's the more more uh, a more important problem, and of course I forgot to say that we also are going to be looking at positive. So the solutions should all have positive components. So <coughs> whatever number we have of variables, um, we're only going to be interested in the positive or zero. They have all all components positive or zero. Okay? So if it's in uh, if it's two ver two components, it will be in the first quadrant. If it's three components, first octant. If it's seven components, it's in that positive cone. It's called in that seven-dimensional space. It's right. It's just just the region where all the, the components are positive or zero. Okay? So this is going to be the standard form. So. How to uh, convert um, LPPs, such as the ones before, to this standard form? Well, we talked about the minimization maximization, so we're, let's skip that. Um, say we have an, uh, we have these. Um, what was the um, um so say we have that uh, example that I had before there, so the example was. <coughs> These are the two constraints. And for now, uh, and we have the x1 and x2 are positive. That's already a good thing, right? Because that's already in the standard form as far as we introduce what's known the slack variables, right?
So slack variables means Let me recall, this was maximizing 2x1 plus 6x2, right? So the slack variables means, does anybody know? We're trying to convert this inequality constraints to equality constraints. So we need to introduce new variables. Uh, let's call it u. Basically, the, if we'd like those inequalities to be achieved, it's the same as saying that the difference between, say, the left side and the right, uh, the, the right side and the left side has to be positive or zero. So if I, if I call u1 to be 1 minus, minus x1 plus x2 and u2 to be 2 minus 2x1 plus x2, then those inequality, inequalities translate into just saying that the slack variables have to be positive, right? And of course, the problem becomes what? Minimize, well, I said we take the neg negative 2x1 minus 6x2, right? <coughs> Subject to. Now, what are the constraints? Now, it's basically these two equalities that relate x1, x2, u1, and u2 are equality constraints. So, I'm going to bring this back. So, it's going to be minus x1 plus x2 plus u1 equals 1 and 2x1 plus x2 plus u2 equals 2. I mean, some people like to put this as different colors so just to in, in, indicate that these are kind of introduced new variables. And of course, x1 still positive, x2 positive, u1 and u2 positive. So those, the, the two first genuine inequality constraints for x1, x2 kind of Kind of that were downgraded to this list of u1 and u2 positive, which is something we'd always like in a, in a standard form. But these two equality constraints, uh, you know, surfaced because now we have, you know, relations between u1 and u2 and the x1 and x2. Okay. Now you'll say, well, is this now in a standard form? Well, it is. I have I have two linear constraints. How many variables do I have now? Four variables. I have more variables. So that's the the uh, trade we have to make. We we may have to increase the number of of, of constraints of, of variables. Excuse me. Um, and we have the objective function is pretty much the same, right? Of course. The objective function won't never will never actually depend on the slack variables. Okay? But because they don't depend on the slack variable doesn't mean they're not is not a linear. Right? You can always put zero times u one plus zero times u two and make it a linear in it's a linear function now. So it's a linear function with two linear constraints and a positive um, component or zero. Okay? 
So what is C? C is going to be negative 2, negative 6, 0, 0. <coughs> what is A? Negative 1, 1, 1, 0, 2, 1, 0, 1. And what is B? This is the right hand side, right? So remember AX plus AX equals B. That's so AX equals B, X positive. And of course I should say what X is. X is consisting of X1, X2, U1, and U2, U2. So this was just an example, but you can now see that anytime you have an inequality constraint, you're going to call that difference between the two, the two sides to be a new variable, select variable, and you're going to call it so that it's positive. So if the inequality is one way, like it is less than or equal to, it's going to take the difference between the right side minus the left side. If it's the other way around, it's going to be different. So in the end, these slack variables are always positive. Okay? And uh, what about if you don't start with the with the zero, with with this? So we already had in our original simplex problem or or linear programming problem, we had this given to us. What if it's it's not given to you? Then there is a way to do that as well. Um, which I'll show you in a second. Right? So everybody agrees this is now a standard form? So yeah. It's a minor point, but you really have to call it Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, that's right. It's, it's actually going to be important uh, to talk about vectors so vectors we're going to be column vectors are going to be um, vertical right so column just like b here of course sometimes just use t and you'll see in books too i mean just, they put transpose to be uh, vertical and why is that important because you multiply a with x so you're going to have to respect the matrix multiplication rules so you're going to multiply this is a two by four and it's going to be by, right? So AX equals B. A is 2 by 4. This is 4 by 1, so this is 2 by 1. Okay. All right, so now what's next? Let's say uh, we, we understand how to convert every linear programming problem to the standard form where you have equality constraints rather than inequality constraints. Well the next thing is to <clears throat> start looking for uh, the feasible region. Okay? So when you have equality constraints, so let's What is the feasible region for for equality constraints? Now we suddenly moved from two variables, the decision variables. Okay, why, why are they called a decision? Because in a practical problem, you know, in the end, you want to know well, what do I have to decide on x1 and on x2? If I had only two, we moved from a right from a picture that we could draw. We moved to actually a four-dimensional. Now we have four variables, and we have one thing that's good is that it's always positive, so it's in that cone, right? Positive cone, but it's in four dimensions. And of course, have you guys you've seen things in the four dimensions, haven't you? Uh, 
And I'll show you a picture in the four dimension at some point, but uh, it's, it's, it's impossible, right? Um, so how can we, how can we understand this feasible region in four or, or more dimensions? Well, here's where a little bit of linear algebra is really helpful. You have, an, you have a system of equations. How many equations do we have here? Well, that's how many constraints you have, right? And how many variables do you have? Uh, how many variables will you have? Yeah. You, this is a vector, so, so you'll have always at least as many variables as you have constraints. And why is that? Because the slack variables. The slack variables alone are in number exactly the same number as the number of constraints, inequality constraints, right? So A is going to be an M by N matrix. where M is less than N, so you have, you have more variables than you have uh, that you have the constraints. More, you have more columns than you have rows, right? So always the matrix looks longer than uh, taller, right? I think I have M rows. Now the coefficients could be positive or negative. We've seen that. Uh, it can happen. Um, and B is is a is a M column vector and um, you know X is an N column vector. Okay? So why why do we uh, why do I say this? Um, basically, I want to look at the structure of that system of equations, where you have more unknowns than equations. Well, that's always an undetermined case, right? You you, you always can you always have infinitely many, many solutions, right? So there's going to be a feasible set. Now, the question is, is that set going to be in the first, in the positive cone, right? And it may, may not be the case. Sometimes you may have your feasible, uh, your feasible set to be empty for the standard form. Um, you may not have positive components or solutions with positive components. Because okay, that's a required there. Now, there's one more thing before we kind of uh, go forward. Is when you have a matrix like this, have you guys heard of the rank of a matrix? What's the rank of a matrix? There are several definitions. One of them. Is the number of linearly independent maximum number of linearly independent rows or columns? Now we said we have more more columns than you have rows, right? So it means that the rank cannot exceed what? M, the smaller of the two dimensions of the of the matrix. Because how many independent rows can you have? At most, M, right? Now, I'm, I'm saying linear independence 
and I'm assuming that you've heard it before. What does it mean linearly independent? Or what does it mean linearly dependent rows? Well, a row like the last row is dependent on the fir on the previous ones if it can be written as a linear combination of the previous ones. Now, if that's the case, for our purpose, we may just delete that last row because it's not a real constraint. Right? If the previous ones are constraints that are satisfied, then because, of, because the first rows generate the last row in a linear fashion, the last row is not an additional constraint. Right? So, because these things come from a real, real constraints for a linear programming problem, we can always assume that all the rows are linearly independent. Meaning that the matrix A has maximum rank. So we can assume that the rank of the, mat of the, of the matrix is always the maximum number of rows, I mean the number of rows, which is M. <coughs> Again, if it's not the case, we can delete the ones that are linearly dependent on the others and kind of isolate only the real constraints, the, the, the kind of the, only the maximum number of necessary constraints that are equivalent to all the constraints that we have. Am I talking sort of, I want you to kind of stop me and say, you know, rephrase it. Because sometimes when I say something, you know, you can know the thing, but you can think of it in a different way. Of course, if you've taken the advanced linear algebra course, these things are a lot easier to visualize. But I understand, I mean, I kind of realize not many of you have taken that. But you've probably seen in, the linear, in any linear, introductory linear algebra course, this kind of concept. Um, and let me know if I'm wrong. Um, so, we're going to assume that, that this, so A is, has maximum rank. Because that's the maximum it can, it can be. And we're going to assume that it's always reaching the maximum rank. It has maximum rank. Now, that being said, what's, what's, uh, what is the implication? That among these many columns, column vectors, how many of them are linearly independent? M of them, M. So M is a smaller number, right? So because our matrix is always kind of long and, th and thin, there's always going to be columns that can be written as linear combination of M of them. Okay? Now, we don't really know which M of them there are, but we know that there are at least a group of M. Right? There could be several groups of M r columns. So, reshuffling the and that's, that's kind of a common thing in simplex method. You can always re-interchange uh, columns with no uh, effect on the actual problem, right? How, how can you interchange columns? You're just basically interchanging the, the variables. So remember, the first column corresponds to coefficients of x1. Second column to x2. Well, some of the columns corresponds to the select variables. So by just interchanging the kind of the label of the column, and we'll talk, we'll do that, um, you can kind of put those M in the first spot, first M spots. So, so by col by uh, by um, um, swapping. columns 
if necessary we can always imagine that the matrix A is a matrix it has we can always put the, the first M that form this first matrix B uh, as I, we call it B so that's a square matrix and then the remaining and N is well it has, still has M rows but it has N minus M columns so this, the second one will not probably will most likely not be Um, not a priori. We don't know, right? So, as I said, if you if you need to swap, if you need to kind of bring some of the variable uh, columns up front, then some of those columns might be actually labeled by the slack variables. Um, Sometimes the slack variables. Some of the slack variables, some of the decision variables. So, it could be a mix. Now. The reason why this is, and this changes from vertex to vertex. So, when we, when I remember, I, ta I, I said we, we're looking for the path, kind of generating a path from an initial vertex, hopefully getting quick to a, to the optimal vertex, right? At each iteration, this swapping might need to be done. So, so there will be times when the slack variables will become what we call basic variables. So, so the variables that correspond to this first M, we're going to be calling them to be basic variables, and this will be non-basic variables. Okay, so let's see. So since, so each column of A uh, is, is labeled by some uh, variable x1, x2, xn. Now, for all practical purposes in the simplex method, once you've converted to the standard form, let's not worry about which one's slack and which one's not. Okay. Slack is in inherently coming from an inequality constraint. So since we have equality already converted to equality constraints, forget slack. Okay? There's no more slack or there's just n uh, variables. By uh, each column is labeled by one of the variables. Right? So, so upon swapping, we may end up, we may end up with a different ordering of these labels. And those are going to be saying the labels of the first M labels are the basic variables and then the non-basic variables. So what's an example? Well, an example is uh, Let's say the matrix is the following. <clears throat> A 
one 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 ninety one zero one ninety one negative one 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 zero one ninety one ninety one And this is from uh, system on page 28. Anyway, it doesn't matter. I mean, right now I have just a matrix that hopefully has full rank, but it has three rows and five columns. And of course, this has. Labels. Initially, you know, you put, you know, X1 through X5, right? So you can make, you can make a system out of this, system of the constraints, if you put the right-hand sides as well. I mean, I can, I can tell you what the right-hand sides are in this example, but it's irrelevant here. Because that, that doesn't change. So let's um, B was one one ninety one. Okay. Now let's look. How can we actually? Uh, what time do we finish? Oh. Okay. What time do we? Um, I'm sorry. Um, how do we? How do we? Uh, how do you check that a uh, matrix like this has full rank? First of all, you would have to show that the three rows are linear independent, right? That's quite of a task. <coughs> or you'd have to find three linearly independent columns. Huh? And the question is, are they the first ones? The first three? Possibly, but if not, we'd have to. We could. We would have to kind of move those. Um, three that are linear dependent on the first three spots. So let's see. This is. How do we see that the three? That like the first three are linear independent. Well, just isolate this matrix. And see if it is. So if we write this matrix to be invertible, so have you heard of a determinant? If the determinant is, is zero, then what is the conclusion? The columns are not linearly independent, right? They are dependent. One is a linear combination of the other two. Um, so we have to compute this determinant. How do you compute a three by three determinant without a computer? There are several ways, right? One, you could expand by, say, the last row. Expanding by the last row means you start with this. Why do I pick the last row? Because I have a zero, right? So I start with this one. And then I multiply by the two by two determinant form here, and I already see this is zero, right? So that's a zero. Then zero times whatever that's zero, plus one times this two by two determinant, and that's negative two. So that's I'm going quite fast here, but because that's not so important. I mean, so it is a non-zero determinant in the first three columns. So the answer is the three. <coughs> 
first columns are linearly independent, right? Meaning that the other two are have to be depending on the on the on those three, on the first three, right? So what do you, what do you do? It means that you don't have to reshuffle anything. B is and N is what's left. So we're going to be saying that x1, x2, x3 are basic variables. And x4, x5 are non-basic. Okay. But this is the choice we, we, we make. Okay. Now, <coughs> um, why is this important? Because you go back to a x equals a times x equals b. Okay? And now you see that <clears throat> you can do like this block matrix multiplication where you have a 3 by 3 matrix here and a, a whatever left is here. And you have a three components here, right? It just happens to be we didn't have to do any shuffling. And x n is the remaining two components, right? This has to equal b, and b is a column vector. So basically, what you get is you get that b times x little b sub b plus n x n equals b. Now, what's the reason for doing this? Well, the reason for doing this is to um, kind of isolate xb in terms of xn. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to say that b, xb equals b minus n xn. Now, everything I'm writing is a matrix multiplication and matrix operations, addition and subtraction. So everything is legal here. Um, and now finally, xb is going to be, so the first three components, those basic variables, is going to be the inverse of b, if I multiply by the inverse of b, we know that b is invertible. That was the whole, so b inverse exists. <clears throat> so, B inverse B minus B inverse N X N. Okay. All right. So you'll say, well, so what's big, what, what do we just what do we do here? Well, this computation is just to show you that to identify the values of those variables is simply a matter of inverting the the matrix B, which we know it's invertible. That's the consisting of those linearly independent columns. And applying this formula, right? One way to do this is, um, is elementary raw operations. It's something that comes in the Gaussian elimination. You have a system of linear equations. You can multiply a row by a scalar and add it to another row. You can swap rows. You can do all kinds of stuff um, so that in the end, When you do this, when you try to solve the a, ax equals b, you end up with an identity. 
on the first m columns. Okay? And of course here is going to be b inverse n and this is going to be b inverse b. Okay, so let's let's now use this uh, show how this strategy will actually work in um, in the simplex method. <coughs> so, you know, again, what's the what's our focus still? And understand the feasible set, right? The feasible set when you have only equality constraints. When you have only equality constraints, what's the feasible set looking like? Well, this this gives you <clears throat> one sort of one um, perspective of of sort of separating basic variables from non-basic variables. There's one more ingredient, which has the name of a, a lemma, so it's like a, almost like a theorem that needs a proof. But what it basically says, it basically says that um, Ax equals b, the solutions of that Ax equals b, that have positive components, x greater than zero, right? Have a very special form. So, <clears throat> um, the feasible set, that is, sol uh, solutions of this system with positive Co uh, components is a convex set in Rn, right? N is the number of variables, right? For, and we forgot about the slack. I mean, we don't have slack or non slack. Right now it's all the same, right? Um, so the feasible, the feasible set is a convex set in Rn, um, whose extremal points consist of vectors with at least n minus m vanishing components. Okay, that's a mouthful. Um, let me try to explain. <coughs> First of all, what's a, what's a, what's a convex set? Two For any two points in the set, the line connecting the two points stays in the set. That's that's um, gives you an idea of basically the the whole convex set will look convex. I mean it has it's like round this way, not not round this way. So it's not like a star. So convex set if x and y belongs to C, then lambda x plus 1 minus lambda y belongs to c for lambda between 0 and 1. And this is just to say that, oops, this is already not a convex set. Um, no. Why am I doing this? Any two points x, y. When you connect the two two of them, uh, the two points, you basically get the equation of a line of the line between x and y, 
but which you can, every point you can write between x, a and x, x and y like this, with a lambda between 0 and 1. So it's a fraction of x plus the remaining fraction of y added together, right? When lambda is 0, you get y. Well, so I guess it could have been the other way around. When lambda is 1, you get x. When lambda is a half, you get the midpoint. When lambda is a third, you get a point twice as far from x than it is from y and so forth, right? And this has to happen for all points. Okay? Now, why is that set that we're talking about convex? Ax plus y, Ax equals b, and x positive. Well, if you take Ax equals b and Ay equals b, so two solutions, and both x and y have positive components, So if C is now the set of X for which AX equals B, right? If I have two points in the set, right? What's this? I mean, a point connect. I mean, we're talking about vectors, right? Yeah, but um, this linear combination, what we call convex combination between x and y, will also equal to b, right? So, if you have two solutions of that system of linear equations. Any convex combination of those two solutions is also a solution, right? In fact, any linear combination, uh, no, that's not true. If I, have a lin if I take any linear combination of this, we may not be able to get B, I think. This, the coefficients have to add up to 1. But anyway, so <coughs> it turns out that the whole line, and not just between A and B, but also could be outside of A and B, uh, X and Y, excuse me. Not just the line in between a, X and Y is included, but the whole, um, the whole line, even if you have positive or negative lambda. See, there's no... I didn't say anything about lambda being between 0 and 1. Okay? So it's a little bit more general than that. But we also have to say if x is positive and y is positive, this is when it's important that you're looking only for lambda that is between 0 and 1 because then this is positive times x and this is positive times y, right? So the combination of the two says that this, lambda x plus 1 minus lambda y, is a solution to this system, and it has positive components or zero components. So it's, it is also in that set, right? In the feasible set. So the feasible set is convex. That's one thing. But we said a few more things. We said the extremal points of that convex set. So what's the, what does it mean to be an extremal point? So let me conclude. So I started with x, y, and c, and we got that that linear, uh, convex combination is in c. I mean, c is convex. So it looks it's not necessarily round, but it's like. It doesn't have concave points. It doesn't have something like this. It's not concave, right? No, not convex. 
because you have two points. Okay. So, what about external points? So, external points. So, a point V is called extremal point for the convex set C if not only that it's on the like edge of the uh, what we say the boundary of the convex set that is if there is a line that would you would actually be able to go out of the set right that would be boundary point but it's if there don't exist x y uh, such that v is between x and y that is think of convex set like this okay this is a convex set right v right there's no two points in that set that would actually you could actually draw a line and the line segment would would would, would include v okay that's what now you're going to say well isn't every point on this picture Extremal? And the answer is yes, on this picture. But here's here's a situation when this is not the case. What if, like, so this is round, right? But what if it's like a straight line here? This is a convex set. Right? But this is not extremal. Uh, no point on this side is extremal, except the vertices. Agree? So this is extremal. Well, this is right. So everywhere where the the, the set is kind of round, uh, strictly round, <laughs> that basically means you have extremal points there. But where you have edges that are uh, vert, uh, like um, borders, um, boundaries that are straight, like faces, those are not extremal points because you can actually, right? You can kind of make <coughs> Why is this point not extremal? You can find two points that kind of enclose that uh, if you if you if you draw the straight line between the two. Okay. So um, th this this concept has has very um, nice. Um, I mean, it's very important. It's, it's probably the most important thing in simplex method. Is what's an ext what are the extremal points of the feasible set? Um, and this is kind of only kind of touch and passing in the book, so that's why I'm kind of spending a little bit more time. But certainly, you should you should kind of complement this with with uh, what the comments are uh, the author makes. Um, so again, back to our feasible set. What I said there is that the extremal points are points where several of the components vanish. And there's an exact, num exact number. N minus M. So in other words, that's exactly what that difference in the size of the, of the number of rows and number of columns. At least those many components have to vanish. So I'd like to be able to prove this, but I think I'm going to have to postpone it for Wednesday. Um, but basically what this is saying is that
if you think about um, the feasible set, it's going to be some sort of a of a hyperplane. So what's a hyperplane? If you, if you forget the, the constraint that, that the components have to be positive. If you just take solutions to this, right? And just think there is only one constraint. So this, this matrix is really just one row. Yeah? Then this would be sort of a plane in 3D, a line in 2D. It would be a three-dimensional plane in 4D, right? It would be sort of a flat object that's one dimension less than the dimension of the space, right? If you only have one constraint. If, if you have two constraints, it's going to be whatever flat object you can think of that has dimensions less two than the dimension of the whole space, right? If you have M constraints, it's going to be flat, meaning flat meaning that it's you take any two points in that thing, the whole line is going to be contained in it, right? Of what dimension? <coughs> exactly the, like the Rn, we are on Rn, we have n variables minus the number of constraints. Every constraint reduces dimension by one. Okay, so is this flat? It's not a hyperplane. It's not the right word, but um, it's it's a flat space subspace. We you know uh, well, it's not a subspace even. It's it's a translator of the subspace. The subspace would be if you have a, a x equals zero, right? So let me let me point that out. A x equals b is a translate of the subspace x for which ax equals 0. Okay. So it's a right, so it will be a subspace that goes through the origin, translated, and then it would be only what's in the first positive cone. Well, only, only everything that's in the positive thing. So there's going to be this convex set. So if you are in the positive cone and you look down, you're going to see what? You're going to see one of the only one, right? Everything that's not in the first octant or, you know, whatever uh, dimension you have, you discard, right? So from this hyperplane, you're only going to get what's in that, what's the intersection with those uh, faces, right? Now, this intersection here is going to be basically points where some of the components vanish. Because you chop that hyperplane by faces of this standard system of coordinates, right? So you have, you have um, for instance, you could have x1 equals 0. If the first component equals 0, so you have um, the plane that's, the hyperplane that's orthogonal to the x1, the standard basis, right, the, the e1, whatever, the first vector in the standard basis, right? So that's going to, that's going to correspond to some face of this, right? Now, there's going to be another face corresponding to x2 equals 0. Of course, this vertex is going to correspond to the f place where both x1 and x2 are equal to 0. But that's, it's hard to, to kind of go, go on because you don't know how many variables you have. But the bottom line is that uh, the boundary of this feasible set, and we're talking about equality constraints here, standard form, are going to be consisting of, are going to be characterized by a number of components of x to be equal to zero. And what that lemma says is that 
at this extremal points, so these are the extremal points, right? At least n minus m are zero. So at an extremal point, so again, this is ax equals b and x positive. And this is the view from the positive, positive cone somewhere out in the open, right? At an extremal point for this feasible set, um, we have at least n minus m vanishing component. So, one phys one one uh, extremal point could be characterized by the first, by the last n minus m to be equal to zero, right? And then, kind of permutations of that. Um, I don't quite sure that you will have exactly as many external points as as many combinations of. I don't think you do that. But how do you prove some something like that? Um, well, to prove to prove this, and again, I, I may have to leave it uh, for the next time. Uh, the idea is the following. The, Well, let me say one more thing, and then um, I'll postpone that that proof for for for, for the next time. Um, let's take this for sort of like for granted, okay? I mean, it has to do with the dimension of this flat thing from which you chop this polyhedron that is n minus m dimensional, right? Um, In addition to that, now if you put in the picture the, uh, uh, the um, objective function, which is a linear function, we haven't talked anything about that. Remember, we kind of dropped it from, the, from our picture. But if we bring it back now and we say we're interested in maxim uh, minimizing an objective function on this feasible set, right? then that objective function has, is a hyperplane. It's a real hyperplane, right? It's a hyperplane, so it's going to be again something. That has sort of this representation, right? So it's going to have the maximum achieved at the at a extremal point, okay? Now, <coughs> again, taking this as 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 a, as a fact, um, when it achieves the maximum, uh, the minimum, at a, at a uh, at a extremal point, right? It basically says that you can achieve a minimum at a vertex for which n minus m, at least n minus m of the x's, x1 through xn, are zero. So, sort of the just the conclusion of this would be that um, to minimize the objective function C x, it is enough to. Um, seek vertices or what we call to seek extremal points on this feasible set meaning that 
um, x n minus m components of x are zero. So we call these basic solutions. These are called are called basic feasible solutions. So what's what's an example uh, just to uh, clar clarify this it would be x one x m and then zero zero. Okay, and some of the x one through x m could also be zero. Or x one x m minus one zero x m plus one zero. Right. So you have to have at least n minus m zeros. Okay? And by restricting your search, you know, the simplex method is going to walk on these vertices, only on this kind of vertices. By restricting it, you're going to actually restrict uh, the search to a, I mean, to a very small number of vertices compared to the whole, service, uh, whole, service, whole, whole uh, set of vertices. And how are we going to do this in practice? <clears throat> Just to anticipate. So you're going to start with a kind of a choice, your initial vertex. That's going to be a basic feasible vertex. So it's going to have n minus m zeros. Then you're going to have to look for where can I change, you know, I have to change a zero to a non-zero value here. But of course, I'm going to have to create a zero where it wasn't a zero. Okay? So that's going to be the iteration. You start from one, and you go to the next one, and so forth. Um, this is exactly reflected in the um, one I was just showed you earlier. In this. Um, applet in this tableau, right? So let's just take a look here. Now, the one thing you have to kind of realize is we have started with inequality constraints in that example, three-dimensional three example. But we've imagined, I mean, we've already kind of converted to equality constraints by introducing slack variables. So, and I think we use u0, u1, u2 here and x, y, and z. So we can think of, of all of this as being x1 through x6, right? In fact, even the value of the, uh, of the objective function is considered as, as, a, as a variable. In this, in this tableau, okay, so it's not <coughs> any different than the one I, I've, I've told you before. Um, what do you put here? You put actually the metrics, right? So the matrix uh, A is going to be the constraint, the equality constraint, right? Notice what happens at the, at the, at the slack, uh, what used to be the slack variables. You have 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, right? Um, here you put the right-hand side of the constraints. And on the last row, you put what? The, co the coefficients of the objective function with, of course, it was a maximization problem, so it becomes negative 20, negative 12, negative 18. Zero, 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 right? Now, because we also use the, uh, the objective function as one of the variables, we use a one here, basically, and then a zero in the, in the constraint. Basically, if you read this last line, it would be that p equals 20x plus 12y plus 18z. Okay? So that's the last line, and that's exactly what the, uh, the objective was, right? Is it 130 or 140? <sighs> okay. So I'll let you play with this. I'll just show you this. Um, the strategy will be to actually, in mean, the simplex method, it tells you how to actually start um, 
you know, swapping the, I mean, basically finding the next step. So how do you find the next column where you want to put a non-zero value for x? And how do you replace one that wasn't zero, you put a zero? And um, this is a nice application. It just shows you how to pick the variable that, that's what I call the, the enter, uh, entering vari variable and then leaving variable. Oop, wrong one. Just have to be careful. You can build it again. It turns out to be the first one here. And every time you do this, oh, I'm sorry, this again. Okay. Every time you do this, and you watch the value of p, you 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 see that actually it goes up because it's a it's a it's a maximization problem. The next one. So this is one iteration. You've moved to a to a new vert vertex. The first vertex was zero zero zero. The next vertex is three zero zero. Here, this vertex you can actually plot it. Um, the next one is going to be, I think, this one. And it was 16 before, and now it's 64. Okay. And then you do it one more time. I think it's this one. Um, and you end up to a, to a value of 70. And that is exa that that you know uh, the the simplex method. I'll, I'll tell you the crit criterion for stopping. Basically, if you're positive on the on the bottom row, um, says that you have to stop and you find them optimal. You can show the vertex, which hopefully, yeah. So you can you can see that in this case, this vertex is achieved, right? And this tableau just basically kind of um, encodes everything that goes in the theory of finding of of increasing or decreasing. Objective function in case of standard form, we're trying to minimize, um, and doing this one step at a time. So basically, making a walk on this extremal points of the feasible set. Okay, um, I want you to start looking at some of the problems for Wednesday. So that will be the first, your first homework on page. Um, <clears throat> 63, numbers 1, uh, numbers 5, and numbers, actually 4 and 5, okay. Okay, so um, let's see. Try to do these problems with the simplex tableaus. Okay, I think the first problem says uh, do the graphical method, but um, it's probably easiest to access to to uh, rehearse on the well. Yeah, try to see if the, I mean, the applet should actually help you in four and five because it's three-dimensional ones. Uh, for number one, it's two-dimensional. I mean, you can do either way. Yeah.